Hi there, and welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hello there, welcome to episode 101 of 1% Better, the podcast where I interview people from all walks of life, from all areas of the world, and from lots of different perspectives all with the focus on improving hopefully by one percent or more each time it's funny we hit the 100 mark last week that doesn't mean i'm 100 percent better uh then i'd be perfect i don't believe in perfection but the idea was with one percent is one percent increments in whatever area that topic might be that week so last week maybe about leadership uh the week before Again, management, wellness, meditation, all of those different areas, you can inch forward, hopefully, by listening to some of these interviews. And this week will be a new topic, one I've never dealt with on the podcast before, and I'll talk to that in a minute. But as always, look back a little bit. So last weekend released the episode with Matt and Aunt Sheila, and it has been a really positive response, even despite the sound quality wasn't up to scratch as good as it could be i guess but i think most folks got over that and as you get into the interview you'd probably start to listen more and forget about some of the background noises and the hoovering and stuff like that so sheila has a a very interesting life story and hopefully i was able to bring some of that out in the show some of the stuff that you didn't know about before um so if you haven't checked it out please do go back download subscribe to the podcast obviously and download that one and have a listen and if you did want to watch the video of it it's on the patreon site that's uh, patreon robert green and it's there so continuing to record episodes in the last week or so recorded two more one with a ceo and another with a suicide survivor both very open and honest conversations and they will be uh, certainly interesting ones when they come out i am always keen to try and release more than one a week but it's just not really possible at the moment because it all takes time to record to edit and to market it and I suppose put it out there and share it that's why I ask you guys to help me when I release an episode if you see me tweet or post on whatever platform give it a retweet give it a share a like that all helps and it helps from the perspective of sharing it within other circles and folks listening to it and that's really what it is all about I did send out a tweet about a week and a half ago around how to start a podcast and that's something I'm considering putting a workshop together an intro workshop together in the near future it's more around the why the how as well as the what so not just the tools and equipment but really digging into your why that's one of the big reasons podcasts stall after a period of time you just don't know your why going into it and some of those ideas of success and fame and glory doesn't come to pass and uh, you lose interest so i would uh, be up for that Uh, i've got a good response so far probably do it in cork in a venue to be determined open to suggestions or offers if folks listening in cork have a conference room they could let me use email me rob at rob of the green.ie i would absolutely do it in other parts of the country as well if uh, the demand was there but let's start with with cork so probably sometime i would imagine in may um but nail down a venue and put it out online to uh, subscribe to that so let's see where we go so as always i do shout out on the show at the start to subscribe and that's because it helps ranking of the show in the different podcast charts Uh, i I always bad mouth the rankings as well because i know you can buy your way into that I'm, i'm certainly not trying to do that if you enjoy the podcast please do subscribe you get them all then when they come down and it helps ranking position and other folks get to see it and i have to repeat that every time because it's important and new people might be listening every time and they don't know how some of these charts work but the more subscriptions not just downloads but subscriptions the the better so that would be really appreciative of me to you and that's typically the only ask i have the other one i suppose is to like share comment online because again that gets uh, it into the eyes and views of others and they're really the other two the third one is patreon but that's totally up to yourself if you if you enjoy all of this yeah, you can go to that and subscribe there okay so this week is with susan winter my guest is susan winter and she is an, a relationships expert so this is the first time i've focused purely on relationships in the podcast susan has 
a series of accolades behind her name. She's been on Oprah Winfrey talking about relationships. She has been on the BBC, ITV, CNN, the Today Show, Good Morning America. The list quite literally goes on and on. She's written books, one called Allowing Magnificence and another, her first book, Older Women, Younger Men, caused a stir when it came out a number of years back. Recently, she hit over 10 million views on YouTube, which is quite a substantial number, and she definitely knows her stuff. She was great in that I didn't have to give her any questions beforehand. She was open to everything I asked during the podcast, and she was brilliant at answering them with insight, experience. Certainly, you know from listening that she can definitely understand the challenges of relationships and a lot of the stuff from it i've absolutely taken on board myself i think there's learnings we can all take from this episode she talks about online dating the challenge with different cultures in relationships setting boundaries creating a purpose goals for relationships terms like breadcrumbing catfishing and of course ghosting i knew a couple of them i didn't know breadcrumbing before i have links to susan's site and all her social platforms in the episode page of this and i would encourage you to check it out i really enjoyed it the hour went by rapidly and that's always a good sign we covered a lot she is a complete and utter lady and really really enjoyed talking with her so there you go i hope you enjoy this one episode 101 with susan winter take it away susan thank you and enjoy this season as i mentioned in probably some of the uh, first episodes of the new season i'm trying to go deep into certain areas and have kind of top level categories and this one is probably around communications and then maybe a lower level of communications in relationships and i am delighted to introduce a relationships expert author lots of titles here i have a question on that susan winter welcome to the show hi rob how are you doing pleasure to be with you today I'm good. I'm I'm in Ireland. I'm in Cork, and you're in in Arizona. So I think we're in a different kind of climates at the moment. But uh, we'll we'll try not to let that impact our conversation too much. Um, so Susan, all all these credits you were obviously on on Oprah. You've been on so many different news shows. Your accolades coming out left, right, and center. I love asking the question when I talk to people with you know so many different interests. Is there a specific role? or kind of responsibility that you're you you enjoy doing the most i always i i like communication and i knew that well i come from opera which is why i went to new york i'm new york city based you've caught me in the winter here in my home in the southwest because if i work off a laptop and skype and a phone why be in 12 degree weather right Mm -hmm. so um uh but i like communication and whether it was other people's lyrics or other people's uh, theatrical books or um, lines and monologues, or, you know, eventually it became my own with my own books and my own uh, things that I needed to say. So I began by interpreting others and then found my own voice through a series of different um, careers. And it's interesting, Rob, how I feel that life will urge you forward into wherever you need to go next, if you can allow it to do so. I think like most people, I got bored being in the same profession over and over again. If you reach your maximum capacity and all you can do is more, then uh, you know I kind of lose interest. I need to keep expanding and growing. Mm-hmm. The same reason that I wouldn't stay in one category of discussion forever. I'm best known for older women, younger men in this genre of relationships. But after I did that, like 11 or 12 years, I'm like, I'm so done. Mm. I, it's, I, I will always speak about it. And I know that I'm like one of the world authorities in this area. But, you know, I think that we all need to honor our process of curiosity mm-hmm. and movement and growth. And if you feel compelled to go in another area and explore something new to really honor those urges, because I think they're taking us to new and fertile territory. That's something that we need to, you know, discuss, mm. learn about. Mm. It's it's interesting you answer that and, and a couple of things you just mentioned there really kind of triggered in my own mind stuff that I'm kind of dealing with on a, on a regular enough basis. You know, if you're, say, for example, hypothetically speaking, you're doing something for 10 years, like you said, you were older women, younger men, and you start feeling those urges, a lot of people resist them. 
and a lot of people probably bury it and are, are maybe afraid of taking a different path. How do you how do you actually kind of tap into it and and honor it? Do you, is there appro- approaches that you you uh, advocate? Well, because mine was in the same same genre of being a relationship expert, I simply added all new content to my website. So I still had all the older women, younger men articles, and I would still have discussions about it, and I would still work with clients on that area, but I added general relationships, and then I added dating because I was best known as a relationship expert, meaning you're in a relationship, you're having a problem with your existing mate. But in our current time period, at least in the United States, it's all about getting to partnership. So, so much more conversation around finding love and how do you get through the confusion of what are we and is it a hookup and am I with you? Are you with two other people? What are we doing here? So I started working in in that area because I wanted to answer those questions. I didn't abandon my forward career, uh, my past career. I just expanded it into new territory so i'd stay interested mm. and interesting you know very good yeah no that that makes total sense i think um you're kind of pivoting a little bit i suppose if, if, if that's yeah. a term you know you're kind of adding but but staying true to your, your background um i do want to get into some of those interesting relationship questions and certainly in the new world of uh, of online dating and and all of that good stuff it's not that new maybe i suppose but yeah, no, there's but it's- It's a beast unto itself. Mm. And for any of us that remember meeting organically, this online dating is, is, I mean, it's loathed by everyone I know. It's, it's unnecessary to expand beyond Mm -hmm. your locale, but it is also plagued with, you know, flakes and creeps and uh, posers and catfishing. And uh, I mean, it's just, you're kind of going into enemy territory, trying to come out alive with some good recon, you know, that you've got somebody that you found some connection with. So it's it's pretty crazy. <laughs> I, just while we're on that topic, you mentioned some of those terms and I've, I've heard of ghosting and, you know, catfishing. I think I traded emails with you about that word. Breadcrumbing. That's not one I've heard before. What, what the hell is that? <laughs> You know what? Um, I purposely didn't Google it so that I wanted you to tell me. Yeah, you you know, here. so here's my, okay, breadcrumbing. First, I'll give you the definition. Then I'll give you my take on all this. So breadcrumbing is, um, you know, where... Was it, were, was it Hansel and Gretel? Who left the little breadcrumbs to be found in the in the forest? Was it yeah, Hansel and yeah, Gretel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, breadcrumbing is where your partner leads you on. Okay. And they... They give you a trail to follow, but you're not ever getting anywhere. They're just kind of giving you little bits and pieces. Um, There is a plethora. uh, Wait, I'm saying that improperly. There's there's an entire new vocabulary for these terms that we've applied. Mm. And because we're taking analogies from common day and trying to apply them to this new thing that's happening. And whether it's ghosting or haunting or breadcrumbing or window shopping or catfishing, we are describing these bizarre uh, twists and turns in the getting to partnership cycle, which seems to be so incredibly daunting nowadays. And we never had to do this 50 years ago. You know, if somebody that you went out with dropped off the face of the earth pre-1990s, you probably think something horrific had happened. <laughs> yeah. You know, they were in an accident or they moved or, oh, my goodness, they've been abducted. You know, you know, nowadays it's like, oh, being ghosted. Okay. I've heard of people breaking up after they've been with somebody by ghosting them. Mm. I mean, just like not even bothering to have the responsibility to say, by the way, it's not working out. We need to break up. It's like never responding to them again. No closure. So <laughs> we are in such a bizarre time period as far as this dating and relationship world that uh, everybody is confused by the dismantling of the traditional archetype, which, you know, I'm a major proponent of. I'm glad that the, we broke out of the uh, cookie cutter image of man, woman, you know, marriage, this is it. I think that we needed to expand to be more inclusive on different tastes and different forms of authenticity. Mm-hmm. You know, not everybody wants that thing. But in the meantime, 
what failed to happen was a solid infrastructure under which people could function and say, oh, I, you, they didn't know how to speak to each other. They didn't know how to communicate their wants and needs. So you ended up with this jumble of like, nobody knows what's going on. And then they're acting out in bizarre ways, normally abdicating responsibility by doing either breadcrumbing, not being honest with, I kind of want you, I don't want you, I'd rather have you on hold just in case I want you, mm -hmm. catfishing you, pretending to be somebody that they're not online because they know there's no chance you'd ever look at them if they showed you their real profile picture. <laughs> Um, what is the psychology behind that, that? I wonder. Have you looked into the details? Sorry for interrupting on, on on the catfishing. Like, what is it? Is it obviously if 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 they spark up that relationship be, by being that kind of pretend persona, that if they actually do get to the point where they meet, that, you know, that's not going to work. So, what, what do you think is driving that? Well, the person who is catfishing you gets the opportunity to feel like what it would be to be desired okay they're placing a photograph of somebody who is not themselves far 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 better looking they're giving you a lifestyle that they could never possibly attain so they're trying on the costume of what is it like to be adored because they don't feel that in and of themselves they're enough so that's the thrill for them mm. but obviously setting themselves up for a massive fall when if, if ever they actually if go they if they get caught right so, so typically do they just before it gets to the point of taking it to actual physically meeting with somebody they generally might just back away then so they've had that adoration but never had they were still in control effectively there are thousands of stories. Oh, my aunt is sick. Oh, my dog is dying. I have to fly across the country to get to my brother. I'm starting a new job. I'll be in Europe. I won't be back until. So there's tons of reasons that you're given roadblocks. There's um, a TV show, a reality show here in the U.S. called Catfishing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the guy who originated it had been catfished. Mm -hmm. And he fell for a girl that he met online that he thought he had a relationship with. And as it turns out, when he discovered he was catfished, he hunted her down. He found her through social media and through links and through calling people and looking up addresses and met with her and said, why did you do it? And they had an honest discussion. And, you know, she revealed some of the things that, that I said, actually. I mean, that's my take on it. Yeah. But I don't think she was as articulate. And yet at the same time, he decided this is a great venue for a show. I'm not the only one that this is happening to. Mm. So he and his buddy track they they get letters from people that are madly in love with somebody and they're not able to meet them they don't know what's going on they wonder if it's real they don't know why it's moving forward and they hunt them down and introduce the two to each other mm. yeah and I, then it's you know sometimes it's not even it's a it's a a man pretending to be a woman yeah yeah, yeah so, no, it's a show it's actually i think the same show is is on over here the, the u.s version of it we can we can catch it sometimes i haven't seen it in a long time but yeah i think uh it's an interesting idea i'm going to kind of give you a kind of throw a strange one at you here when i was growing up uh very close to my aunt and she would make me watch movies from the 80s and 90s and when i was thinking of questions to ask you the movie when harry met sally came came to my mind and it, there's a line in that where he said, men and women can't be friends, that sex always gets in the way. What's your take on that? Men and women can't be friends that are attracted to each other. Mm -hmm. Men and women can be friends if they're not actually attracted to each other. Okay. Um, and, and the dicey thing is that attraction can indeed grow in time, that somebody you're not visually attracted to, you can find that you like a lot as a person, so it kind of... It puts them on the yes, I'd I'd get with them list. Mm -hmm. okay. But I do believe you can have male and female friendships, but each person would have to have inherent boundaries because all it takes is a pint or two too many and the right circumstance, and there you are. <laughs> yeah, okay, I, I won't go any further with that one. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> when you were talking about the like, relationships now and how they start online, but but then maybe 30 or 40 years ago, you know, people might meet out, date. Like d dating as a phenomenon is very much an american thing right in, in in england in ireland dating didn't really happen i don't think as in you mightn't have had a formal four or five dates before you kind of get to to start seeing somebody officially until until the last 20 years i i think but 
how deliberate are people that in your experience over those last few decades where where they they actually explicitly talk about their 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 goals for the relationship and and you know the purpose of the relationship it, it seems to me a lot of the time it just kind of maybe goes unsaid by the guy and and maybe the, the lady might try to, to to put more structure on it maybe talk a bit about your learnings or knowledge in that area exactly well you've um, accurately pinpointed the biggest problem in today's current world, at least in the United States. We and, and part of this is the millennial culture that has been such a disruptor of so many things. Um, in, in eradicating traditional roles, I think because they were trying a lot of things on to see how it felt and they didn't want the stricture of it has to be this or it has to be that, the first thing was that they would be seeing multiple people. So it, it was kind of a shock to me after the year 2000 in America that if somebody came after me and wanting to date me, in my former experience of the other part of my life, that meant, of course, you wanted to have a relationship with me. And Rob, once in a while, people such as myself would get fooled. Every girl would get fooled once in a while. Somebody just came to hit and run and never wanted to be with you. A player who pretended he was interested. But it got to the point where I had to qualify what was happening and I had to proactively speak up. And somebody said to me uh, with my boyfriend that I was seeing, it was a, it was a new fellow I'd known for quite some time. And, and they said, well, you, you have to have the exclusive talk. And I said, what do you mean? And they're like, well, you know, you don't know what you have with him. And I said, but uh, he's a good guy and we've just become romantic. We've known each other. She said, oh, no, no, you've got to clarify this. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, you've got to be kidding me. So I had to find my own language. But what you've said about not speaking up is the exact problem that is so prevalent in the world in which I work. Mm -hmm. We have men and women greatly confused in this specific generation of the, the millennials, not knowing if it's right to speak up, if it's cool to speak up, if they're going to look weak and needy. You've got women who are hesitant to say, I want a relationship because they don't want to be discarded from the get go. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, I'm like, whatever, whatever. Yeah, it's cool. I'm just going with the flow. Obviously, a guy who doesn't need to make commitment because you can have sex outside of a relationship. What's his inducement? to be in a committed partnership when he can have everything that he wants with none of the responsibility. So many women have gone mute for fear of um, being difficult or having the guy run away. Many guys don't know how to speak up and say what they want. Um, and everybody is feeling too, I'm afraid to be weak. I'm afraid to be needy. I'm afraid to look insecure by saying what I want. So I advocate absolutely speaking the truth from the beginning to pre-filter anyone who's just not on the same page and ultimately will hurt you mm. you know just next 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 they don't want you they're not ready for a relationship i used to have i'd have lines that i would say to people like are you open to the possibility of a relationship mm. because if he's not even open to the possibility of a relationship this is a one-time thank you for the coffee and that's it mm. what am i doing there you know so these things are necessary. What was never needed in the past is now vitally necessary today. Hmm. In scenarios like that, though, if you're, you or, or me feel extremely attracted to the person that you're having the coffee with and you just see the chemistry, you know, the, the, but do you kind of then, is it difficult to stick to your you know you're filtering and and say well maybe I'll, I'll bend the rules here this time and you know that sort of uh, approach you know it's those off-road adventures that are often the ones that we remember as being the most exciting moments of our life we we can you know skin our knees and kind of hurt ourselves but um you know, people will make a decision as to whether they want to proceed or not based on their level their tolerance for risk if you know you know i try and explain to people that um Rather than being obsessed with can you trust them, the better question is can I trust myself? Mm. Can I trust mm. myself to explore what might be risky and know that no matter what happens, I might get my heart bruised, I might get my ego bruised, but you know, I can dust myself off. I'm resilient, I can go on. And I felt like taking this chance. Mm. So um, I'm a proponent of knowing 
your limits and knowing your agility and your recovery rate as far as entering areas that well none of none of love has a safety net so let's just start with that but i mean people try to make smarter choices to eliminate potential pain correct mm -hmm. interesting and would you say having that very detailed kind of conversation it's almost like um i'm trying to do a silly parallel to kind of creating a team in, in a work environment where you're kind of storming and forming and norming and you're kind of coming to a an agreement almost but does that take romance out of the equation do you think if if, if you're very this is me and i want to know about you up front before you kind of keep going it takes sexual tension down a bit because sexual tension is built on the unknown factors the palpable but undefined factors that are going on so that's what creates that the butterflies and the anxiety and the excitement so you do take that down a notch hmm. by being clear and uh, being decisive in what you want. It does make it more matter of fact. Uh, so I think that's unconsciously another reason that people don't like to talk about it. They like to just go with the, the wild feelings and like whatever, whatever. But hmm. then just don't, don't be upset when it doesn't work out your way. And like, oh, I never saw that coming because you wanted the ride of the unpredictable excitement mm -hmm. rather than the definable direction. Mm -hmm. And and is that one of the reasons why they say, you know, the six month or nine month honeymoon period is over when those kind of butterflies or that unknown kind of diminishes yeah. a little bit? Absolutely. And that and that's a really important point because I do um, a lot of work around the honeymoon phase in breakups because the honeymoon phase is the idealistic perfect phase it can be three to six to nine months maximum right mm -hmm. and it's kind of based on nature mm -hmm. with um the the daddy staying around long enough to make sure that that the baby is raised and okay before it leaves right so this honeymoon period is where everything is perfect you know we first met them and what we do unconsciously is attach our hopes and our dreams to this person because that's what real love is. Uh, I mean, that's what gets us into love. We we imagine it's like, oh, Rob, oh, and he's got the podcast and he's so positive and he lives in Ireland. And, oh, I can have a whole new life and I can be the podcast, podcast queen with Rob and oh, my life will be perfect. And so you see, I've got this whole thing that I'm buying into and and you're just a part of it. So this honeymoon phase, you have to realize we don't know them well enough that they've let us down. Mm -hmm. 20 years into a marriage, you got so much against your partner. You got a lot with them. Yeah. But it's, you know, if it ends, it's not like, I can't believe this happened. It came out of nowhere. Because, you know, you've seen them, like I say, you've seen them with the crusties in their eyes. And you've seen them with dirty hair and smelly feet. And, you know, the, the glow of perfection is gone. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So... If you were to have a severance in the very beginning part of the honeymoon period and the relationship were to fail, it is to me the most painful of all exits because you're not seeing your partner realistically. You're seeing them in their idealized state and you put them on a pedestal and it's impossible to walk away from the perfect person. Mm -hmm. So that's why the honeymoon period is um, pretty dicey. It's mm -hmm. We're not seeing the real person mm -hmm. at all. So yeah, no, no, I get it, and it's uh, it's funny. Uh, really enjoying this, by the way. Um, I'm asking a lot of questions that I didn't plan to ask. I'm probably drawing on my my history as well. So, um, so I do a lot of coaching as well. So I'm kind of a, a yes. big proponent of emotional intelligence. And for me, I suppose my own journey. Once I started to really understand myself, I became much more uh, able to understand others and be around others in lots of ways so so do you in your uh i suppose it's effectively coaching uh, you know working with people to to look inward and figure themselves out how important is that do you think for a successful relationship well um it's vitally important as you know as a coach yourself uh and a thought leader um Initially, everyone comes to me because they want me to tell them what's going on with the person that's not doing what they want them to do. So 
I know that that's not where we're really going, but I have to honor that because that's why they're paying their money because they want to get it right because they don't know why she's not coming over and why he's not responding to their text message and why, you know, is it the end of their relationship? They've got to know these things. Um, in the end, it is about tweaking the behavior and mostly the thought process of the individual to shift them to another position where a different and better outcome is possible. Mm -hmm. See, I can't control their mate, but neither can they. But what I can do is assist them at, in changing their perspective and energetically approaching it differently so that there's the opportunity for a different outcome. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I know the there's a tool or two that you can use there. You're changing the belief system and... The, the, yes. the, the activating events and things that tie into that so yeah i i get it because exactly. like, you, you can use those sort of interventions not just in relationships but in in my fear of presentations and you know that sort of so, sort of thing so yeah no no makes makes sense in your experience working with clients or or, or, or couples from different parts of the world how does it differ you know from from folks in europe versus the u.s or any specific areas that are more challenging than others? Um, more challenging cultures are more, more of the Arab cultures or the Muslim cultures because of all the strictures on a woman and the dating is very different. Uh, a woman cannot in many countries uh, go up to a man. Uh, she has to wait for him to approach her. She can't be seen with him in public because if she's seen with him in public, it is assumed she is future engagement material and she cannot go online so a lot of these gals that i work with from the gulf states or in other parts of uh the, the arab world they they go to london uh where they can be themselves or they go to frankfurt they they go away to to be a part of themselves to date and to go online and to talk to guys and you know be be a regular girl outside of the strictures of their environment um, and you and you have to know the culture. You know, each time I talk to a person, there's obviously there is what is the cultural expectation of mm. their dating. Then you've also got to figure out then underneath it any religious or or uh, familial pressures on them. And uh, you know, sometimes the decisions are not their own. Sometimes the decisions are more for the family. Um, some of my East Indian clients uh, have an issue about they have a love match that they like, but it's not agreeable to their parents. So there, there's, there's an inner conflict on do I disappoint my parents for my love match? You know, it, there's a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So you've got external factors that are not working. And then you've got an internal person fighting themselves. Mm. Must be fascinating in a way, though, when you have <clears throat> a client from a a culture you've never worked with before. You kind of have to do research, I'd imagine, on on the boundaries. And how you... you learn it very quickly just by hearing how they speak. You you know, when you... So at the end, all people are human beings. You've got human reactivity and human emotions. So people will sometimes write me... Well, they'll write to my media director and say, does she work with gays? I mean, I work with humans, mm -hmm. okay? So it doesn't matter if there's an age difference, if there's a religious difference, if, if you're same sex humans have the same emotional patterns we have our desire to be loved we have our reactivity we have our you know where we get offended we have we want to be a priority so it the the teaching mechanism is pretty consistent the instructions are are within the same category some of the the way I get to it and the way I frame it has to be a little bit different to speak to that specific individual. But that that's it. it. Because we're just all human beings that want to find our way to love. And given whatever external circumstances we have to work with, you know? Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. From your experience, and this is probably when you get asked a lot, but what are the main reasons relationships fail, do you think? People change. Love is whimsical. Love is oftentimes based on attraction. And a person can fall off the pedestal in the honeymoon period, after the honeymoon period. And the person that we thought was so gorgeous doesn't look good to us now. And mm. it can just be that simple. And that um, 
I say a shallow, um, we can discover that they are not who they are showing us, they, they, that they misrepresented themselves. We can discover that the idea of being with them was great, but in dated living, it's not good. Um, I have a friend who has had a long-standing relationship with her partner. They get along, I mean, to custom design this guy for her is perfect, but they both have um, a quick flashing temper. And if one gets stuck in a pattern of being argumentative or disagreeable, it can really erode the entire relationship. And as of this point, their relationship is like, it's like, who knows? Okay. Because it's come to the flash point that there's too much reactivity. And sometimes people just go enough, enough, love you, but I'm not doing this. This is way too difficult. So mostly people didn't want the same thing from the beginning, but they were afraid to articulate it. Mm -hmm. For example, Oftentimes relationships fall apart because your expectations appeared to be similar, but when push comes to shove, they're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I can hear and understand that, that one as well. I was going to ask a question then. <laughs> when do you know in a relationship that, that it, it's come to the end like is there is there points or markers that you say look guys sure. this is the end well there is when it's come to the end for both of you there's when it's come to the end for you there's when it's come to the end for your partner they're kind of different um understandings but if it's come to the end for you you have little or no energy left to put into this you're just spent you're like a gas tank on empty and the thought of adding to it one more time just feels so useless and burdensome. If your partner is done with you, sometimes that's a harder realization because you don't want to admit it to yourself, but you have to admit it there consistently that door is closed and there is no possibility for resolution. They won't even talk to you. They won't listen to it. They're done. You have to accept that that's done. And in the case of the two of you, that you're just too exhausted and don't want to try anymore. It's not worth it that you've both made up your mind that this is not going anywhere or even it's amicable. And it's like, you know what? We were great in raising our kids for the first 10 years, we, but we're different people now. Love to co-parent uh, co with you, but we're not a couple. Mm -hmm. So you grow apart. Mostly you know that there's no more interest in making it right. Mm. Okay sad endings sometimes i would imagine do, do you believe in do you believe in fate i'm sorry say what do you believe in fate fate mm -hmm. you know i um very that's a very interesting question yes and no so i thought years ago that i had to decide which camp i was in fate or determinism right and i thought okay and i would weigh them like some work sometimes some works the other time and i've decided i believe in both at the same time with the i'm going to qualify this <laughs> my personal philosophy is that there is a preferred template for us there's a blueprint that um has been handed to us in our life birth with all the circumstances and the setup and that there is a preferred outcome or several preferred outcomes, but that at each juncture along the way, it is our decision whether we continue or we deviate. And sometimes the deviation is taking us to where we want to go. So that's self-determination. Uh, and yet I think there is an ultimate fate that could be uh, for us, but it is. But, but I still think self-will self has a lot to do with what that fate is. Hmm. So I, I didn't think you, I thought you had to pick one or the other. And I finally decided I can't. So I'm going to choose both of them. Hmm. And that probably feels more acceptable then, right? I, you know, I, I think. Uh, yeah, because I mean, you know, who knows what your fate is? Hmm. I mean, when something happens and you think you're up against all odds, you claim that it's your fate, you yeah. know, or, or that it's your karma. You know, I remember once having a, a, a problem with a boyfriend or getting into a partnership and it was a very complicated relationship and I didn't know myself. I was much younger and I went to some fortune teller and she said, oh, you you probably abandoned your children in another life. And I thought, well, if you believe in another life, I kind of don't. But that's but that's my choice. So 
all these things that we use to make sense for us, that's where we get to pick and choose. We either adopt what is told to us, or we start to choose which scenarios seem accurate to us or plausible. You know, mm -hmm. you and I are never going to know in this lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. But um, we choose a course that we think is philosophically correct. And then all of our choices stem from that philosophical belief. Mm -hmm. Timing is another area that I, I believe is uh, important. Do you believe in or, or do you think that in in some instances relationships work because the timing is right or absolutely absolutely timing is really important to include or exclude you from a life event um i know when i was writing older women younger men i had lived through that situation for seven years through the worst of it in a very small community where i had a home i thought i'd escaped the crime of new york and i had no idea what it would be like to be involved with somebody so much younger and what uh, his relatives would create from that. But the timing of the book was absolutely important and critical because we were seeing, uh, we were seeing, you know, art, standalone articles in magazines and knew, knew that if we weren't the first ones out with this, with a really good book about this, really what it's like from the inside, not, not some psychologist, you know, but really from people that had lived it, that it would never fly. So that was perfect timing being in New York city instead of St. Louis or Dallas or some smaller market, being in the top media market in the United States, that was perfect. Um, other times when, when I was an actress, I was cast in every single Woody Allen film in the 80s, and he was so huge. And they would pull me out of the extras and give me a line. And every time I had an Advil commercial the next day, I had a conflict, something happened, we went into overtime. It's a, another time my boyfriend didn't want me to have a career because he didn't want me to get famous and leave him. Mm -hmm. So all the time they're calling with uh, to get the co costumes together and the costume call, I'm visiting my sick father and I said, is there a message? No, no, no message. That's when we had telephone answering machines. He said, no message, he just lied to me. So oh. every time I was supposed to be in a Woody Allen film, they were like four times in a row, as something happened, you know. So who knows? That would have been a whole different life had that not happened. Mm. Is it for the better? Is it for the worse? It happened. What are you going to do about it? You just keep going, right? Mm -hmm. Sliding doors is a, is another kind of angle yeah. of a chat. Yeah. yeah, very good. You mentioned the first book, your second book, Allowing Magnificence. Maybe just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, well, um, so after I did Oprah, everybody's going, strike, well, the iron's hot. And I didn't have another conversation. It was I wanted to get older women, younger men straight. And so I started writing, and I thought, what do I want to write about? And I wrote about a 1,000 pages, <laughs> and I was trying to boil it down. Sent it to all these agents. They're like, I want you. I don't want this book. It's like a college dissertation. I, I, I don't want it. Right. And it was a little too deep and too advanced. But I took a section of that out that I thought was a new conversation. It's not necessarily about relationships. So Allowing Magnificence is about um, challenges in life happen. And we cannot try to avoid this. You know, we have to get a good skill set to deal with challenges and a good uh, mental framework for it to find the opportunity in the crisis. And if we can't find the gem in the pain, we'll be stuck with the pain. So I try and explain to people how to process the information in real time, hmm. not five years later, like, oh, wow, I'm so glad I didn't marry Jimmy because now he's in prison. Yeah, it, 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 you know, that's easy to do in retrospect, but in real time to qualify why something is happening and the possibilities, even when it appears to be negative. That was the new conversation I really wanted to dwell upon, to have people understand that they have internal guidance, that we were born complete and with an internal computer that blows away everything in the world as far as your guidance system. And when you get in touch with that, you don't need to be calling people and saying, what do I do? What do I do? Because you, you're going to know. You're going to trust yourself. Mm. So those were the two conversations in that book. Mm. Very, very interesting. And how do you kind of drop back and, and kind of get in touch with yourself? Do you have techniques or tools you use to, to kind of connect in and really understand what's going on for you? I do. And to be honest, I have been in such a whirlwind with dealing with clients and interviews and, and television and radio and stuff like that, that sometimes just self-reflection is 
really hard for me. I used to wake up every morning and do a little meditation and everything was so clear. And I would read out my goals before I went to bed at night and focus on them in the morning. But uh, uh, to be, because uh, I don't want to pretend I'm someplace I'm not. Sure. I'm not perfect. I was a lot more on point when I wasn't so busy. Mm-hmm. But um, some of the things that ground me and bring me back to earth, um, I have a puppy. <laughs> and spending time with her, whether it's throwing the ball or just watching her watch the world, kind of reminds me of things that are important and real, being present, being mm-hmm. present in the present moment. And another thing is, too, when you do this kind of work, you get pretty good at analyzing yourself and you kind of know what it is all the time. But if I'm ever confused about how to correct myself, the first thing I say is if I if my issue were that of a client, what would I tell them? Easy. Got the answer right there. Mm-hmm. You know, part number two is, am I actually going to do it? Yeah. Am I going to do it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. That was one of the questions, you know, how you actually the advice and support and service you give to others. How do you actually internalize and give yourself that kind of advice and service to, to make sure you're kind of almost walking the walk yourself? So it's it's probably not straightforward either. Well, in business, I just hired uh, a coach and I'd never done that before because I hadn't, you know, this evolved into a business. I never did this, Rob, as a business. I just did this because I had something to say. Mm -hmm. And then people started coming to me, asking me. So I just hired a business coach to help me, in essence, cut down on paperwork, cut down on busy work and be cleaner and more efficient because I've got dozens of books I want to put out and audio booklets, and mm-hmm. I literally get swept up by the day. So part of it is knowing when I need help yeah, and, and reaching out to somebody because, you know, you think it's kind of weird. The coach needs a coach, but the coach needs a coach. Oh, absolutely. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the fundamentals as well and it, for different reasons. So it sounds like from your perspective, it's, you know, getting urgent versus important stuff done and, and being productive doing things that would be of value as well so you know with so much going on in your world it's it's difficult to kind of filter that out um so no i I totally i totally hear you obviously with so much going on uh you're putting a lot of good content out i've been watching some of the video posts you've been doing over the last while um really interesting nice short bite-sized consumable pieces of information the women are combination locks. I think that was a very interesting one. Maybe just talk a little bit about that one. Don't you think? I mean, as a man, you because we're each so individual. I mean, I don't blame men for being confused because, um, well, first of all, our communication is not direct. We don't speak men correctly. Like we don't give you bullet point answers. We'll meander and tell you a side story and how we felt and what we were wearing and how you know. And then we finally get to the point. And also, um, whatever you learned that made your last female happy might not apply to your current female. Everything from how you handle her and what her needs are. You know, I asked a, a series of women back, oh, geez, maybe 15 years ago. I said, um, what is the most important thing that a man needs to do to show you that he loves you? Mm. Every female gave me completely different answers, Rob. <laughs> Okay. Do you know, I mean, it's the craziest stuff. Mm. Or how would you define a gentleman? Well, a gentleman opens the car door. Well, great. How many still do that? Mm. And out of the guys that try that, four women out of 10 might say, I'm, I'm a little offended. Yeah. Are you, are you, <laughs> you know, intimating that I don't have the power to open up my own door that I'm not. So men really have to relearn mm. their woman. Mm. You've got some standards you can go by generalities like, show appreciation, be kind, listen, try to hear what she's saying, ask what she needs. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, I think they are a combination lock and each lock is different. Mm. Very, very, it's an interesting one, but it's a, it's a good analogy, I, I, I guess. I'm recording this, it's Tuesday, just a couple of days before Valentine's Day. And I'm, uh, I think we, we shared some emails about a, a phenomenon called Galentine's Day? Is it Galentine's Day? Oh, yeah. Galentine's Day. It was from a TV show here in the U.S. called Parks and Recreation with one of our comedians, Amy Poehler, mm-hmm. and who mentioned that, you know, for all her single gals or gal friends, forget Valentine's Day. On the 13th, we're going to have Galentine's Day. Right. And it was covered in one of your papers. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 
I just thought it was interesting because um, it, there has been a lot of movement in the U.S. around uh, establishing single is okay. Because single used to be uh, a very difficult category, especially for people uh, who are female, thinking the world would look at them as though they were unwanted. So it, to break that, there has been a lot of work around single by choice and, hap and singletons and uh, singles events and being with your gal friends and female friendship. And I've got a great career. And yes, I want love. It's going to happen, but I'm not going to feel um, totally uh, depressed if I don't have it. So it's a day to celebrate the solidity of the ongoing female friendships that keep us, you know, uh, even keeled during a partnership or not. Mm -hmm. Would the same apply to men? I think men have a natural camaraderie. Okay. I think they are naturally uh, kind of team oriented with each other. Mm. Uh, they're also competitive, but a competitiveness between men doesn't seem to be taken personally like it is with women. I think men are naturally naturally bond with each other. Mm. Probably, we, probably. We have learned through our culture to uh, compete with other women over the limited resource of men. Because remember, for centuries, we didn't have property, we didn't have a credit card, we didn't have our own money, we didn't have rights. You know, so we needed a man to survive. And I think that's kind of been an emotional hangover. Sure, sure. Makes sense. I saw as well, you mentioned about um, designing an a la carte relationship. Maybe maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, so I've done a lot of research on relationships, what works and what doesn't work. From my, uh, Starting with myself as the guinea pig. Mm -hmm. And I think that in this time of authenticity, the infrastructure that was missing that why so many millennials have had such a problem and other people affected by this new genre of hooking up and who knows whatever and sex is separate from any kind of emotional attachment. I think what we have to do is start to identify our must haves. Now, mine may be completely different. I personally think that for mature people who are not raising children, the point of marriage is ridiculous. It's a mess. Mm between estate issues and money and, and you know, uh, children and step families. And it's just, it's a ball of wax. If you don't, normally one person needs it because the title will give them a sense of security, but marriage doesn't guarantee you security. We know that. Mm -hmm. So it's either I want an elevated position because I've been a wife and I don't want to be a girlfriend because that sounds like less, or it's like, gee, I'm hoping to benefit from your assets. So I, but, but, you know, I think that generally speaking, we have to know what do I want? What do I need? And if I order something, let's say it's on the menu, it's a hamburger and I like everything about it, but I don't want pickles. Like I like everything about committed relationships, but I don't want this one thing. Then I should be very clear with my partner and start to negotiate that because when we're designing what we really know we can do, Rob, mm -hmm. we'll be able to do it. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys cannot do monogamy and they're terrified to tell the truth. And I work with these guys and I'm like, either go to a therapist and figure out why you keep harming the women you love because mm -hmm. what's underneath it, because it's not just about sex. It's mm -hmm. not, it's mm -hmm. a whole lot of other things or make peace with it and say, this is what I am. I accept it. But every woman I meet, I'm going to say, by the way, you'll be my primary love once in a while. I'm going to have an indiscretion. I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to misrepresent myself. And I don't want to hurt you. And I don't want you to think it's not about but there's something in me that has to do it. And I will follow whatever rules you decide. But once in a while, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to take it. So the, this is who I am. Do you want this? Mm -hmm. If we were being honest about what we know we can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. 50% of the relationships that end wouldn't need to end because we have to hide who we are to be okay with our partner. Mm -hmm. How many guys are doing things that they know if they told their wife at home they were doing it, she'd say, oh, you're a pervert. I want to leave you. Mm -hmm. So imagine if we came to a time period where, uh, but then, then the person has to understand that maybe five people out of six are going to go, dude, mm -hmm. I don't want this. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't, I'm not into what you're into. So you're going to lose some. 
Mm. But what you're looking for is that one right person that goes, I don't have a problem with that. Do you have a problem with this? No, I don't. Then we're a good match. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes sense. I, I guess your your point of five out of six probably would run run for the hills, probably would have that impact on the, 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 the male or female opening up and being that honest with it. So they're probably willing to take a... A gamble to say, well, I'm not going to expl- share all of these things that that I prefer, but because the chances of this ever happening might might be, you know, low. So, I think it would take a few generations probably for 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 that to to become the norm. Would you think? Well, I I you know I'm still uh, a person who likes exclusivity. I like monogamy. And but I I like a relationship to be structured just a little bit differently. I don't like I don't want to know the ending of every chapter. You know, I I want to have some flexibility inside there. But there are some things I'm very firm on. And I don't care, Rob, if it's old fashioned. I don't care. Mm -hmm. You don't have to like it. I know what I want. I don't want to be one of a pack of girls. I get nothing out of that. Um, some people don't want to be the focus of one person's attention because they don't want the responsibility that goes with it emotionally for like having to be there. I want to enjoy the best of you, but if your father's in the hospital, I'm not going to be there. Mm. So, you know, you've got to figure out if you have a relationship, how do you want it to go? Mm. And, and, and by the way, the cool thing about doing an a la carte relationship is you can amend this as you go along. You and your partner can come to an agreement of we'll do this and this, and then, you know, it's not working for me. Is it working for you? No, I don't like it either. Why did we do that? I don't know. I guess we had to just go through that. So what would we do instead? So it's really collaborative. Mm. You know, rather than keeping secrets and rather than living a lie. Mm. You know? Very good. And you talked about authenticity. I'm actually, I've done a, been playing with that word for, for a long time and I've just finished writing an article that I put out later this week but you mentioned self-acceptance which I think for me is is absolutely fundamental to being authentic, self-aware yeah. aware and being able to self-manage being vulnerable, they're kind of key tenants for me um, but it took me a long time to, to find it that because I you see a lot of times people talking in work or in relationships that oh I'm, my, I'm very in touch with my authentic self and whatnot, and you can my intuition a lot of the time would say I don't believe you or, or you, you can sense with the person they are. Yeah. It's just interesting when when you brought it up brought it up there. Um fascinating conversation. I will just end with a couple of questions if that's okay. Sure. I no, my time is yours. I booked I my next appointment is until three o'clock my time, so <laughs> okay, it's fine. No worries. What's the most um most important lesson you've learned in the last while? Just something that You've took something from you, you, you. I presume, like me, you're always learning. You're curious. What what comes to mind when I ask that question? Um, you know, I would answer this question each time I'm asked. It would be a different answer. Have you? You know, it just depends on the mood today. But I think the most important thing that I've learned in all of my work is to trust myself. But that's that's because I know myself. I know my pluses and I know my minuses. I know my weakness. I know my strength. But to trust that all is going to be okay. You know, that's one of the benefits of getting older. There aren't a lot of benefits in aging. And especially for a woman, we're not like, oh, yes, I'm getting older. (laughs) I love it. But, you know, one thing is that I love about where I'm at right now is that – I've lived through enough trauma and struggle and crisis and, you know, daunting situations to have survived it. Not mm-hmm. only survived it, spun it to my advantage, you know. So, and then you've had enough wins to have confidence in yourself. So the idea that the life challenges may change their form, the situations may seem more daunting than others, but that at the end of the day, you're going to be okay, that we've developed the skills and the trust in ourselves that, that, that you know, we can handle it. We're, we're, and, th- and I think that's a very important thing that comes with learning who you are and comes with a little bit of age and, and wisdom. You know, when you're young, you don't have that to, to pull on. You have hope. Mm-hmm. Now we have history. Mm-hmm. So that's the difference. Very, very good. Do you have a cliche or, or a favorite saying that you might say that you believe in? 
Oh, oh, well, in relationships, I won't be less because you can't be more. Okay, very good. Meaning oftentimes people will diminish what they want and their participation because the other person can't rise to their level of capacity. So the goal is never to be less than your greater self. The goal is to understand that some people aren't your best option <laughs> for partnership. Cool. Nice one to, to kind of wrap it up on. What's next for Susan? What's on your horizon? I know you have booklets. You probably have books in the horizon. So much going on. What's uh, what what's to be expected in 2019? Um, I'm doing more and more on camera stuff and I'm doing more live Facebook live and YouTube live interactions. And I'm looking to expand how I do my videos because I like the one on one talking, but I want to start interviewing other people and having more off the cuff conversations. I, I really love speaking to audiences, to big groups, but I don't like keynotes. I don't want to memorize. I don't want to be reading cue cards. Mm -hmm. I love being in front of a group of people and just off the cuff. So we have back in New York some um, intimate evenings where we have a dinner and a presentation, very much interactive. And my media director, Lauren, and I are now crafting different um, formulas for uh, Facebook Live for these contests where uh, they're going to vote on which question was submitted that they like the best, and then that person will receive a gift from me. Mm. So um, we're trying to get more. Um, the, the goal for me is to come as close as possible to two-way communication with my audience. Mm. Brilliant. And I think you're really embracing the, the the social media and multimedia that's out there so i think it's going to work well i think this this interview has been really good for, from my perspective i i learned a lot i hope the the listeners and viewers when we put it out uh get something from it too uh and and obviously maybe just to wrap up how, how folks can get in touch with you susan because uh it'd be great if from the back of this you had a couple of new potential clients Oh, Rob, you are so sweet. Thank you very much. Um, I do appreciate that. I'm SusanWinter.net, and that website has everything from my consultation page to the shop page where you can see the books and the audio booklets. Um, so you're welcome to look there. And then I'm all over social media. I've got a great YouTube site, which, as a matter of fact, if you just start by going to my website, you'll click on a section that shows you the videos, and you can jump right straight to watching it on YouTube. And to date, I have about 350 videos that I've done oh. in under two years. So okay. I crank out two a week. Very good. And so that's a lot. <laughs> cool. Brilliant. I'll put I'll put links into to all of those. Oh, and and maybe even you could put this video up on your, your channel once yes. we once we get yes, it out. Absolutely. Yeah, that, thank that, you so much, Rob. That thank would be you. brilliant. Susan, thanks so much. Have a great rest of day in uh, in Arizona. Thanks Rob, so much. Thank you. And Happy Valentine's Day to you, and thank you for this lovely interview. Thank you so much. No, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much for taking the time. It means a lot. Appreciate it. Hey, guys, just before you go, I'd love to hear from you if anything specific stood out from that episode, something you might take away and try and implement in your own personal or professional life to help make you that little bit better. On the other side, is there anything you think I could do better to make the show even more enjoyable, more impactful and maybe meaningful? So drop me a note, rob at robofthegreen.ie or connect in on any of the social platforms at Rob of the Green. We also have a community on Facebook. Check that out. If you're really enjoying the show, maybe you could try and leave a rating or a review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts app, Go in there, give us a rating, let us know how we're doing. That'll help with the ranking of the podcast up those charts. The more folks that potentially see it because we're high up, the better. The more that might listen, that never heard of it before. And the goal of the show is to try and reach more and more people and have that impact more and more. So that's down to you. Please do help me with that. I'm not going down the route of hiring podcast promoters, quote unquote, from other parts of the world because they say they can help with the ranking and I don't really believe them or it's not very authentic. Help me do it in an authentic way. I'd really appreciate it. This year, I'm going more all in on Patreon. So it's three bucks a month. You can sign up, subscribe to Rob of the Green on Patreon.com. That will give you access to Patreon-only content. 
Nearly all the episodes of the 864 podcast are on there and new ones will be added only there. The 1% Better Show will have early releases there, but will still come out for free on robofthegreen.ie. There'll also be live shows this year, some phone-in shows, extra content, three euros a month. Will hopefully, the more folks that subscribe, allow me to do more and more stuff on there, add more and more content. At the end of the day, that's the price of a pair of socks, maybe, that you might lose, or a coffee. One way or the other, it's up to you. If you want to join, you'll still get free stuff otherwise but if you're enjoying what we're doing help us grow help us expand it i'd really appreciate that adding new stuff onto the website all the time there's an affiliates page under the be better drop down check in there there's training courses that you can sign up to more and more stuff will come in over time into season three now of this fun fun journey huge learning hopefully you're getting something from it too stick with it let's keep going enjoy the journey even more have a great day week weekend and thanks for checking it out good luck